It's not widely known that in the outskirts of Christchurch, on the hills overlooking Nelson, and on the plains near Levin are three special hospitals run by the Mental Health Division of the New Zealand Department of Health, caring for 1,500 patients, most of them children. These are not ordinary hospitals, and the patients are not necessarily physically ill. The children here are sick, yes, but the sickness is locked away inside their heads. They are all mentally subnormal, and they are all in need of help. The public doesn't often see these hospital training schools, as they're called. It prefers not to think about them. But actually, these are inspiring places, where the close, misty horizons of the mentally retarded's world are slowly clearing. And here, parents find a road leading to understanding and acceptance. One of their first problems is to accept that they have an intellectually handicapped child. Until parents do this, very little can be done for the child. They mustn't feel any guilt or stigma, for the condition's a common one. It occurs in all walks of life. And beds in hospitals like these must be provided for roughly one in every thousand of the population. We like parents to keep in touch with the children, to write to them, to visit them when they can, and if they wish to, take them out for short times when they come to visit. Visiting is at any time on any day. We have no fixed visiting days. And, uh, of course, during the initial period, the child would be under medical observation and the various investigations and tests would be being carried out. And so, one morning, Brian enters a new environment, a villa playroom where he's accepted and understood, and where, at last, something positive will be done to help him. All children reach out eagerly toward life, but these will never grasp it firmly. A retarded mind restricts them, narrows their world. But this narrow world can be widened, and they can be helped to live happily in it. The first step is to assess their potential, and nurses watch for signs which perhaps will indicate lines of training, and these assessments are discussed and re-examined at staff meetings each week. Social training starts at once, and self-reliance is encouraged. Understandably, parents in their anxiety tend to do things for these children, rather than train them to be independent. It's less trouble for parents, but in the long run, this harms the child. Endless repetition and patience, inexhaustible patience, is required before the children begin to feel a confidence and can start to help themselves. One group, besides being mentally retarded, have an additional handicap. At home, possibly jealousies and tensions gradually grew until a deep emotional disturbance developed in an already sick child. Now it has no social sense whatever, is lonely and withdrawn. And yet, if they're going to be helped at all, the silent barriers the children have built around themselves must be penetrated with care and endless patience. These rooms are equipped with an extraordinary collection of the most unlikely material. The children help themselves, do as they like, but they are quietly encouraged and observed. In this happy, relaxed atmosphere, a child's interest can be caught, but a wrong glance can send it trembling back into the vacant world behind dead eyes. They gain confidence and take tentative steps first into a make-believe world. <laughs> then the reality of this world and the companionship of similarly retarded playmates is faced. In time, the walls of isolation crumble and the child is free. 
Some patients are severely subnormal and need the constant care of the nursing staff. Nevertheless, the hospital knows it must guard against the staff taking the place of a child's parents, for nurses grow very attached to their charges who are here for long periods, often permanently. And every child, particularly these, needs and must have one thing, love. In the kindergartens, the formal training for most of the patients begins. We seldom think about our hands. They automatically carry out the commands flashed to them by our brains. But only by endless repetition and concentration can the simplest movement be learned by a hand only vaguely controlled by a mind forever wandering. Frank is learning to grasp objects firmly. Someday he may be able to hold something, perhaps even a spoon or a cup. We seldom stop to think how fortunate we are. Our children walk and run, their eyes and minds seldom giving a thought to what their feet are doing. But here, a concentration and a will to succeed, almost too painful to watch, is necessary to make one stumbling foot place itself in front of the other. But these are the great triumphs and rewards in these children's narrow world. Today, after 10 months, I walked on the stones and the sense of accomplishment is as overwhelming as being made captain of the school 15. Right, now who have we got here? No. Is that Malcolm Knowles? No. Has he got his jumper on? No. Has he? Oh, oh now, and who's this? No. Is that Frankie Best? No. Is it? Yeah. And what colour have you got on? No. Right, now, this one, who's here? Is Richard running in the race? Yeah. Is he? Uh, Sit down, Richard, that's a good boy. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, I think we're putting the slides through a little bit too quickly, aren't we? Colour slides are used frequently in their training, and the children's response is immediate and enthusiastic. What do we say? Get... Now come the crucial training periods, for it's here that the future of the patient is decided. The children are watched, judged, marked and discussed. If things don't come easily to a normal child, he can generally persevere until they do. But here, the difficult is impossible, and it's at once discarded and forgotten. Through games, the child is encouraged to develop what aptitudes it has, for a single feeling of failure can destroy years of patient progress. As the months go by, two groups emerge. In the first are those who it's felt can be educated, and in the second, those who can be trained only. Academic learning of any kind will forever be beyond them. Advanced patients from both groups have short and frequent periods of occupational therapy, developing skills and mastering movements. The children love this, and it's sometimes difficult to keep them out of these happy, busy rooms. Here they're encouraged to concentrate, to hold things, to count, and to coordinate the movements of the left and right hands. One day a clay pot, crude, misshapen and without beauty though it may be, will sit on a shelf a symbol of a small girl's patience and determination. The largest group is the trainable subnormal, and for them a tremendous amount is being done. Instead of becoming society's castaways, with training these patients are taking their place in the sheltered environment of the hospital community. In the carpenter's shop, for instance, where the boys make playthings for the younger children, they feel they're needed and being useful. The lads are happy here, for years of idleness can be a frightening thing. 
Some are quite brilliant in perhaps one direction, and this is encouraged and developed. Most of us get a thrill out of creating something, and here, where there's no competition, Mike delights in writing all the signs needed in a busy hospital. Henry, at 14, might be crouched in a corner, staring hopelessly into the future. After years of training, he moves like a sleepwalker, but he slowly and proudly makes all the coat hangers used here, and in other hospitals. The acknowledgement of a mentally handicapped boy as a person is important to his development. And once he realizes that he is wanted and not useless, that what he does is important, the years ahead are easier to live. For this large group of trainable patients, young and old, their future probably lies here, in the sheltered environment of the hospitals themselves, where they'll be happy among their fellows and protected from the emotional strains and upsets of the outside world, which can sometimes be cruel to those it doesn't understand. Few of these boys and girls will ever find a place in the competitive world of industry, but a factory has been set up in the hospital, and Levin business concerns have been wonderfully cooperative and provide simple box work for them to do. But charity is not sought, and the factory keeps faith with its clients and delivers its products promptly on due date. To some, each small fold is a triumph of will over reluctant hands. To others, the vanity of speed is an intoxicating excitement. The children enjoy expressing themselves, making things. The noise, chatter, movement, working alongside friends for short periods appeals to them, and the feeling of lonely isolation gets left far behind. Under one patient in every ten is in the second group, those that are educable, and the children have formal training in special schools that the Department of Education has set up within the hospital itself. And put it on the map in the right place. The cost of it will be sixpence. And when you find the one I ask you for, I want you to hold it up. Now, I want you to count out the number of pennies you would need to buy that car. Now, count them out in a nice, loud voice. One, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, six what? Six. Six. Pennies. Six. Pins. Pins. Very good. When you're walking along the road down in Wellington, you sometimes see these notices on the road, uh, along the, uh, on the road. What, what's this one, Roy? Do you know it? You have to stop and let the cars go past. Got to stop and wait till the cars. That's very good. What do you think it means, Arthur? Stop. That's fine. That's very good. You know what that means. When you're at that job. These boys and girls must be prepared by their teachers for many things. Misunderstanding, impatience, rebuffs, teasing. I'd say that I lost my bus. Yes. What would you say, Cameron, if you were late for work? Saying my alarm clock didn't ring up. In the hospital community, everything's done to make life as normal as possible. The patient's interests and hobbies, in fact, are wider and more varied than many children's. The reps practice on a field ringed by old English oaks and chestnuts. The hospital sports teams play the neighboring schools and sometimes actually beat them. Sports day, and sideshow tents squat around the edge of the field and wild, exuberant races are run off in the centre. There are prizes for everyone, thanks to the profits from the cardboard box factory. And it's a day of bewildering excitement that'll be talked about for months. Patients are sometimes taken into the nearby bush and learn something of our native trees and flowers. We take the natural world around us so much for granted, and it's hard to realize that some children who've lived most of their lives in institutions may never have known anything but flat ground and can find an incline confusing and difficult.
Imagine what sleeping out in a tent means to these boys, or waking up to the sound of a river and the early song of birds. Those who can go to an annual camp and are encouraged to do as much for themselves as possible. This strange, unfamiliar world can be a little frightening, but as the strangeness fades with the sunny days, life is full of new experiences and sensations. The hospital day doesn't end at sunset. After tea, hair's combed, shoes are polished, and a uniform proudly donned, and a shy, withdrawn boy becomes part of a group, feels he belongs, and responds. This belonging and not being treated as different is important. Parents often tend to make up for a child's handicap by spoiling her instead of trying to treat her as a normal member of the family. Playing the jungle game, nobody notices if a boy can't sing, if he's hopelessly out of tune and awkward. He's a hunter like everybody else, fearless, brave and clever. These activities are organised by people from nearby Levin who realise what the patient interest of a stranger can mean to these people, sometimes conveniently forgotten by their friends and relations. Women from church organisations come week after week, for years sometimes, quietly and unobtrusively helping those who can't help themselves, talking, reading their letters to them, trying to make the paper words meaningful and writing what their lips can't say. Men from the Levin Junior Chamber of Commerce, Rotary and Lions Clubs and other groups come too. They willingly give up one evening out of every seven to spend time with these handicapped children, to talk and play and laugh with them and make them feel their people. <laughs> Levin is proud of this psychopedic hospital on its outskirts. Most of the townspeople take a keen interest in the children and help them in many ways. These women have busy, full lives and families of their own, yet find time each week to visit the hospital and sit behind the scenes making trousers and pennies for children, many of whom are unable to appreciate them. Mental subnormality is no higher here than in other countries. Still, it strikes more than one in every thousand, and in any family, often without apparent reason or explanation. Not long ago, life for these people was difficult and often without hope, especially as they grew older and their parents died. Now they step forward together into a future where they are wanted, helped and cared for. The dark edges of these clouded minds are being pushed back and the work and training programs of these hospital training schools which are attracting wide interest overseas, are now giving the mentally retarded a full life and a hopeful future.